so thank you everyone and the speakers before me. I've been asked to speak a bit about trust and safety and I want to use a particular example that I'm involved in um, rather than maybe theoretical concepts which I could also draw on. But this is specifically about an initiative that's called the Charter for Change. And the Charter for Change was established um, up in the run-up to the World Humanitarian Summit. So I'm coming with humanitarian experience here into the came for dev crowd, which isn't always as, uh, as prominent as other development sectors, of course. And so why the Charter for Change is because it's an initiative uh, that's led by both national and international NGOs to change the humanitarian system. Now, anybody who works in humanitarian know how, um, how vested the, the traditional system is, how, how vested the interests in the traditional systems are, and how difficult it is to reform that. Now, the Charter for Change is not a paid for, it's not a, a funded initiative. It's really uh, international NGOs signing up and saying, yes, we want to be the change. We're going to make these eight changes to how we fund, how we communicate, how we partner, etc. And uh, local organizations, local national CSOs and NGOs that said, yes, INGOs, you shall make those changes and we will be here to collaborate with you and help you to make those changes. So what's interesting, I think, about this is that it brings together a lot of, uh, I guess, the north-south, uh, as well as the vested interest tensions within the humanitarian system into online collaboration. So just to let you know, there's around 30, 32 signatories, INGO signatories, you can see them here, and there's over 350 endorsers, which are mainly local and national NGOs and CSOs. Um, I'm trying to move my slide. And so just this slide, hopefully, that you're seeing is just a, an indication of the kind of issues that we're trying to change in the humanitarian sector. You'll see the funding, you'll see how we partner, transparency, how transparent are we as international actors about the, the funding flows that actually go to local responders in humanitarian crises. It's about not recruiting from local organizations when we as INGOs want to mount our own humanitarian responses. It's about advocating to the wider sector in terms of the changes that donors need to make or that the United Nations systems need to make, et cetera. So it goes on equality, how we communicate, et cetera. And how we do that, the main vehicles that we use are online groups. In our case, it's facilitated by D groups. And these are the main groups that exist. So there's the C4C -C signatories and it has 101 members and you'll see that's only for the signatory representatives. So for Oxfam, for uh, Islamic Relief Worldwide, for CARE, for CAFOD, Cordaid, you name it. There's also a group for C4C -C endorsers. So those are mainly the local and national NGOs and there's 138 representatives in there. You will see already there's big discrepancy between who's actually in the online group versus all the organizations that endorsed it over the course of the years. Then we have common groups, and those are C4C advocacy, so uh, jointly advocating towards the out external system, if you will, that's jointly INGO representatives and local national NGO representatives, and others talking about capacity and a coordination group, which is basically a mother group kind of trying to coordinate the whole initiative, which is voluntary, so that's interesting. That's also joint local and national NGOs. So just a couple of things. I, I went into uh, into the into our membership and I asked them what they felt uh, was most important in terms of safety and trust. So this is straight from those we want to serve. And what came forward strongly was a sense of belonging and purpose. The fact that C4C is a collaborative movement that, that can demonstrate change by example. So really trying to be the change that we want to see that brings us together as local and international NGOs but also the ability to build pressure through collective voice. Um, and, and remember, all of this is done online. So although these things might not sound like online, this is all done through the groups actually and through the relationships that are established through the groups. So actually influencing the UN's global humanitarian response plan for COVID-19, for example, influencing the grand bargain and, and, and donors positions. They also mentioned that, yes, it saves time and resources to participate and therefore ensures wider participation. The fact that they know that they are with hundreds of local and national endorsers in here talking to these quite powerful INGOs is a reason for them to feel like, um, like they, they belong, right? That there's a purpose for them here. 
the fact that endorsers and signatories come together on equal ground, right? We're all part of the same groups. We're all making use of the same technology. Of course, we have different access to technology and, and time, et cetera. I'll come back to that. Um, but what makes it feel trustworthy for them is that, it, that the spaces facilitate cross-learning. And again, this taking up advocacy comes back forward and forward time again. The endorsers group is interesting because um, it, it, if you compare it to the signatories group, um, there's a lot of people that are very familiar with online collaboration, online, you know, email is their, is, is their home base, if you will. Uh, whereas the endorsers group, there are very remote and rural local responder organizations in there um, as well. What has really worked for them actually is to establish a smaller group, uh, a task group, where they meet in you know, face-to-face -face virtual calls, where they define what are the issues that they wanna bring forward to the larger collective or to the C4C signatories, and then to bring that back into the wider uh, online discussion group, for example. So whereas if it's only online discussion and, and trying to prompt stuff uh, by endorsers, among endorsers in the open space that is this D group, that hasn't taken up as much traction as when they come together in a much more, you know, uh, simulating virtual or simulating a physical interaction and then going back to the bigger group. What works in terms of types of information is really the, the intelligence from the sector. Why are we all in there is because collectively we know a lot more about the humanitarian reform, humanitarian system uh, than as individual agencies. The fact that we feedback from meetings, personal perceptions, you know, notes that we've taken, it's not a very formal space and it's not an officially, you know, uh, mandated space by anybody. So we can come in and that's our safe space where we are together as a collective versus, you know, representatives of individual organizations. Transparency was mentioned, the fact that when we do surveys or we, when anybody does surveys uh, from within the space, it comes back to that space and people are transparently informed about what the results are. What I'm seeing now is spikes. So there's the ongoing kind of uh, uh, information that makes it relevant for this particular community. But the spikes now, you will, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but the, there's a lot of building on the Black Lives Matter, for example, and the inequities within the humanitarian system and the continued you know, funding going to the UN and large INGOs like Oxfam. There's a whole movement building around local actors matter. Actually, all this, you know, talk about reforming the system and localization of aid, you know, actually standing up and, and creating products together, creating campaigns together, and loads of local actors signing on to that, ones that haven't been actively participating in the online dialogue before, but signing up, up and, and sending their logos and saying, yes, this is what we stand for, and thank you for doing this for us was a huge spike in terms of activity. Uh, this is my last one, so I'll be quick, but what hinders is what people have said, and, and I think this might, um, some of you might relate to this, is that um, endorsers generally, local and national humanitarian organizations in this case, and also some smaller signatories, don't have funded policy procedures. So you find that in the joint spaces, INGOs have funded humanitarian policy offers for officers, for example, whose job it is to talk about this stuff, to scan the sector, to, to think about this, to network, to do it, et cetera. And so a lot of the, the, um, so the, joint, uh, the, the joint spaces sometimes are dominated by these international you know, humanitarian policy officers, which actually is intimidating for a many of the local and national responders who are actually out in the field responding. So actually being able to manage that is, is often difficult. Um, added to that, the COVID-19 workload, as, as many of us have experienced, but especially for local responders in terms of their engagement in online collaboration has, has made it much more difficult. So affecting their ability, their well-being, their ability to engage. And again, while we are relatively cozy, you know, here in the Netherlands, speaking for myself, relatively cozy, cozy in my attic, um, the hardships that local staff from local responder organizations face is much, much more significant. Lastly, I want to kind of talk about what they put forward when these online spaces include too much jargon and too much sophisticated language or concepts at short intervals, it can be overwhelming and it affects their psychological safety. So often self-confidence is reduced uh, when there is a lot of information or dialogue on the groups among highly informed people. 
um, so their ability, you know, their, 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 their feeling of safety and trust that they, in themselves, that they have something to contribute because they're not as well, as well aware of all of these things that are going on as perhaps internationally seated people are, but also their self-confidence that what, you know, what they are saying is actually the most informed thing to say. So you can, you can see um, uh, participation being reduced. So if there is too much jargon, if there's too much sophisticated language, if there's too many people, which is interesting, um, Yasmin, that you say you have dedicated experts on, on uh, financial inclusion that lead your conversations. In, in our case, we don't. We don't have dedicated or paid for communications leads. So it's really kind of, uh, you know, a more organic uh, um, engagement. Uh, but you'll see that when there's too much of, of these very specialist people that are talking about what they care about most, localization of aid, that actual trust and safety, sense of safety diminishes. And you see endorser groups going back into, you know, the spike in their own group where none of us kind of sit and then putting out advocacy messages rather than possibly engaging in that joint advocacy and that joint sense making, which is actually what the initiative is about.